Uh, hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do is look at a collision between a clay puck and a stick. Now, in my previous video, uh, which I'll link in the description down below, I dealt with a similar problem. We had a bullet strike a stick. However, in that video, there was going to be one important difference. I had a pivot point. It was connected to a hinge and everything was rotating about that pivot point. In this case, we remove the pivot. So we simply have a stick resting on a table and I'm going to fire a puck at it. Uh, in this case, I'm going to consider an inelastic collision where the puck sticks to the stick and everything kind of moves. So we're interested in a few things. Uh, number one, what is going to be the velocity of the center of mass of the system after the collision? So we're going to calculate VCM. Uh, number two, if the puck hits it at some position which is different from the center of the stick, it's not only going to move, but it's also going to rotate. It's going to acquire some angular velocity. So we're going to calculate the final angular velocity of the system. And in the third case, like I mentioned, this is an inelastic collision because the object sticks to it. That means you're going to lose some energy. So we're going to calculate the energy before and after, and we're going to look at this ratio of the final kinetic energy of the system to the initial kinetic energy of the system. All right. So, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to my channel. It's the best way to support Physics Ninja. All right, let's get started. All right, so what we're going to do here is let's just define a few things. We're going to have this puck. We're going to assume that the mass is m. And just for this problem, uh, let's also assume that the mass of the stick is also little m. So that's kind of a specific case. You could make it general. Um, it makes it a little bit harder, but just to keep the math kind of... Uh, within reason, let's just do this approximation right here. All right, we also assume that this puck is going to hit the bottom of the stick and then stick to it. So first question I have for you, is linear momentum conserved? Well, first thing you have to consider is our system. And our system is made up of two things. We have a puck plus the stick. Okay, and this is what is made up of the system. And you have to ask yourself, are there any external forces acting on the system? There certainly are forces. There's a force acting on the puck, and there's a force acting on the stick, but that's it. Okay, there are no other forces. So yes, uh, linear momentum will be conserved in this type of collision. So that means we write that the total momentum before has to be equal to the total momentum after. Okay, so that's it. So what do we have before? We only have one object moving. Its linear momentum is mv. That's it. And then after, what do we have? Well, we've got this combination, right? We've got the puck and the stick. So each one of them has a mass m. So m plus m. And everything is moving. At least the center of mass of this system has to move to the right. It has no choice. There's no external forces acting on it. Okay, again, if you were going to make the stick mass different, you just simply change that value. All right, so that's it. At the end of the day, I just write that the velocity of the center of mass is m v divided by 2m, right? Just add both of those, so you get v over 2. Okay, so that's the velocity of the center of mass after this collision. That's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, next question we have is, well, is are there any other quantities that are conserved in this problem? Well, let's think about it for a minute. So what we have here is if I consider the rotation relative to the center of mass, okay, uh, there is no external torque acting on the system. For the same reason, there is no external force, right? Because there's only this interaction between the puck and the stick. So which means that the system, not only is it going to have some translational motion, but there's going to be some rotation at some angular frequency omega about the position of the center of mass, which is moving this way. So what you have to do is you have to look at the total angular momentum before the collision. And this is relative to the center of mass of the system. Has to be equal to the total momentum, uh, angular momentum after the collision. Okay, so where is the center of mass of the system? So again, if you have two objects, one of, is of mass m and they both have the same mass, uh, we can calculate its position, right? Where is its position? I can calculate it, say, relative to this guy, right? The position of the center of mass has to be right here, one quarter of the way down. 
Okay, and for to show that, all you would do is do y of center of mass is, say I just calculate it relative to this position. This is the zero position. All right, what do you have? You have this object of mass m, which is a distance of l over 2 away, and divided by the total mass of the system. In this case, it's 2m. Uh, the m's cancel out, and you're left with l over 4. So it happens to be right here where I've denoted um, this x value. Okay, so that's the position of the center of mass. Now, how do you calculate the angular momentum relative to this position right here? So before the collision, how do you calculate the angular momentum? Well, angular momentum, if you remember, let's just write down the formula for the magnitude. It's simply mv, that's the linear momentum. The distance to the pivot, uh, we'll just call that d, multiplied by sine of the angle theta. In this case, it's going to be sine of 90 because you have a velocity that is perpendicular to the axis here. Uh, so we don't really have to worry about this term too much. All right, so that means that before the collision, all you have is for the linear, uh, for the angular momentum rather, is mv, and the distance to the pivot is L over 4. Okay, that is the total angular momentum of the system before the collision. Now, what do we have after the collision? So after the collision, what you have is we have a puck that is rotating. It's a certain distance from the pivot. We said it's L over 4 away, so it has some angular momentum. And we also have this stick here that is rotating about an axis that is not in the center of the stick. So this is how I would write it. Again, I'm looking at kind of a solid object that's rotated. Let's first do the moment of inertia of the puck. Let's fix this, the puck multiplied by omega, that is the angular momentum of the puck, plus the angular momentum of the stick. So for that, we have to write the moment of inertia of the stick multiplied by the same omega. Everything's rotating with the same angular frequency. All right, so we have to now work at evaluating what is this total right-hand side over here. So the moment of inertia of the puck, uh, this guy is pretty straightforward. It's only one object, and it's a certain distance away from the pivot. So it's simply m r squared, and r is the distance from the axis of rotation to the position of the object. So in this case, it's m l over 4 squared. All right, I'm going to highlight that value. That is our moment of inertia of the puck, which I'm going to substitute back in to uh, my equation for angular momentum in just a second. Now, how do we calculate the moment of inertia of the stick? So again, I'm rotating the stick about the axis that goes through the center of mass. So for this, what we're going to do is we're going to use the parallel axis theorem. And the moment of inertia of the stick is you write down the moment of inertia of the stick through its center of mass, plus you have a correction factor, which is m d squared. That's the mass of the stick and multiplied by the distance from this new axis to the center of mass of the stick. So let's have a look at this. The moment of inertia of the stick, this one you look it up in uh, your textbook. If you rotate it through the center, the moment of inertia of that stick is 1 12th m multiplied by the length squared. Plus now we have this additional correction here from the parallel axis theorem, which says that it's the mass. And what is the distance now between the center of mass of the stick to the axis of rotation? Well, it's also L over 4. That makes kind of our life a little bit easier. All right, so we have to now substitute uh, this moment of inertia here of the stick right here into this expression. All right, let's go to the other page and work on our equation for angular momentum and simplify this a little bit. It's going to allow us to solve what is the angular velocity of rotation of the stick mass system. All right, so let's work on our angular momentum equation here. The left-hand side, let me just keep it as is, mvl over 4. All right, here I can factor out an omega, i puck plus the total moment of inertia of the stick rotated about this axis over here, um, multiplied by omega. All right, so let's work at adding then both of these guys, right? It's moment of inertia of the puck plus the total of the stick. That's just adding both of those expressions together. So that we can do. Um, I'm just going to do it separately. Let's maybe call this I total of the system. Um, so I total. 
Again, you just got to be careful here. So the first term is m l squared over 16. It's just squaring that uh, term. And then we have plus 1 12th m l squared plus again m l squared over 16. Um, these two terms are easy to combine. They are the same. So let's just get rid of one of them and add a 2 over here. That simplifies my life. And then once I added the 2, well, and I could cancel out the 2 with uh, the 16 to give an 8. All right, the last thing I have to do now to get the total moment of inertia, just find a common denominator. Uh, again, I have 8 and 12, so I think I should be able to put that on 24. If I put that on 24, this term here will become 3 over 24. This will be 2 over 24, so at the end I'm left with 5 over 24 uh, ml squared. So the fact that I've made the masses the same kind of makes this term just boil down to just this simple expression. If the mass of the stick and the mass of the puck were different, then this would just be a more complicated expression, but not too bad. Now we go back and substitute the moment of inertia in this uh, total equation right here. So then we get our final expression for omega. So the left-hand side is mv L over 4. And the right-hand side now, that total moment of inertia was 5 over 24. Uh, ML squared multiplied by omega. My goal is to find omega, but let's simplify some of the math. Now this 4 and this I can simplify. The masses vanish. Now what else? One of the lengths vanish. And I'm left with my final expression now for omega. Uh, let me make sure I do this right. This is 6 over 5 is the fraction. And then I still have one V value and divided by that total length of the stick or of the rod. All right, this is my final expression for the angular speed of the system uh, as it's rotating about this axis over here. All right, so not too bad. The last thing I want to evaluate now, let's compare the kinetic energies, the final versus the initial, uh, now that we have all our other quantities. All right, the final thing is, is kinetic energy conserved in this type of collision? Well, right away, you should be able to answer this problem, no. But let's actually calculate it before and after, and we'll evaluate this ratio. If it is uh, different than 1, then you know that it cannot be conserved. So uh, before the collision, what is this initial kinetic energy? Well, we only have the puck moving. So all we have is translational kinetic energy of the puck. Uh, that's it. So what do we have final? Again, we're considering the total kinetic energy of the system. So what you have here is one half. We have the total mass that is moving, right, with some velocity of the center of mass. That is the translational part. Now we must also consider the rotational kinetic energy. So that's one half, the total moment of inertia, multiplied by omega squared. All right, so we have two terms, translation plus rotation, and we must evaluate both of those. So this term you have to be a little bit more careful with. So one half, uh, the total mass of the system, in this case is simply 2m. They both have the same masses. The velocity of the center of mass, we've evaluated that. That was the first part. We found it was v over 2, and you have to square that term. All right, nothing too complicated with that. Uh, what about the next term? The next term is the rotation. We have one half. Um, we calculated the total moment of inertia of the system. For that, I had 5 over 24 uh, ml squared. And the final omega is what I just calculated over there. That was 6 over 5 v over l and square that term. All right, you have to be a little bit careful with some of the math now but it's pretty straightforward. So let's cancel out a few things. Uh, this two can cancel out with that. So let's first work at this first term. So we have m uh, v squared over four. Okay, once I carry out this squared term, plus, all right, the next term what I'm gonna do is, well, let's just write it out as one half. Let's keep this first term just the way it is. So that's five over 24 ml squared, and now what we're going to do is just uh, take this out. So this here is going to be, if I evaluate the square term, this is 36 over 25, right? And it's going to be v squared over l squared. All right, now there's a bunch of terms I could uh, factor out or I could cancel. l squared leaves with this one. 
what else? The 24 and the 36, I can deal with those. Um, it, if I divide through by 12, this will be left with two, and this guy here is going to be left with three. I can also simplify the five and the 25. That'll leave five down here in the denominator. Okay, now I'm gonna clean it up one last time. So we get m v squared over four plus, now let's look at all of these terms together. What do we get? We have three in the top. Uh, what's at the bottom? We have four multiplied by five, this is over 20. And we're left still with m v squared. All right, so all you have to do now is again, put things on a common denominator to put things on uh, the ratio of 20. It's pretty straightforward. Multiply by five, so I'm left with eight over 20 m v squared. Again, the math is just a little bit long, which is why I wanted the masses to be the same. Uh, what can you do now? You can divide by, um, Maybe four again, yeah, divide by four each term. So what are we gonna be left with? We're gonna be left with two for this guy and five for this guy. All right, so my final kinetic energy, look, it is two fifths mv squared, that's k final. Okay, so the final thing I really wanted to evaluate was this ratio. What is this final kinetic energy over the initial kinetic energy? So my final is two fifths mv squared and my initial was one half mv squared. So what I do is, well, mv squared, and instead of writing the two down here at the bottom, I'm just gonna bring it right up here in the numerator. Uh, I can combine both of those terms, which gives me four fifths, and then you can cancel out all of these mvs they leave. So that means, look it, I have four over five is my final ratio of K final over K initial, right? So I still have 80% of the initial kinetic energy after, right? I didn't lose, I lost the only 20%, okay? Um, you don't lose as much when you hit the object down here. If I would have hit the object right in the middle, uh, and if I redo this calculation, you were gonna notice that you're gonna lose more energy than you do in this case. Because here you still have some rotational energy here uh, that's left over in the system. All right, folks, that's it for me. Hopefully you appreciate this problem. This is kind of a good one, okay? A good one to know and deals with a lot of important concepts using conservation of linear momentum and angular momentum. We'll see you next time.